be. I am first and foremost a scientist who happens to be a woman who happens to be trans. Hello and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. We're your hosts, Sandra Fendel and Alison Lewis. And today we're talking to Sophia Forslund, who is a group leader at the Max Delberg Center in Berlin. And we're talking to her about her unique experience as a woman in science. So maybe just as a, as a start point, could you give an introduction to yourself? So just what you want to tell us about you, where you're from, what did you study, your scientific background, and what you're doing also as a group leader? Absolutely. So my name is Sofia, Sofia Foslund. I am from Sweden originally, um, where I grew up in a tiny little place on the East Coast. I went on to do a PhD in Stockholm in bioinformatics. Uh, at that point, I was sort of phylogenetics oriented, evolutionary bioinformatics oriented. Then I went to do a postdoc in 2012 in Heidelberg at the EMBL. And I was there for uh, eight years, was supposed to be like two years, and then there was just more and more and more things to do. Uh, finally, uh, and I got a junior group leader contract in Berlin at the Max Delbruck Center with a minor affiliation to the uh, Charity University Hospital in 2018 in Berlin. And I moved there. And what my uh, laboratory is working on is what we describe as host microbiome systems medicine. And one area that I want to try to start doing more work on, and we'll be doing more work on, uh, we've got some funding and uh, the really scary part comes to try to set up studies, is to look into what's described as gender medicine, uh, which in this case is the study of uh, sex differential manifestations of diseases and treatment responsibilities, where you have these interesting situations where, for example, there are forms of heart disease that behave quite differently in men and in women, and it's a little bit unclear why this is the case, if this is driven by cultural factors such as diet or smoking habits, and if it's driven by genetic factors or if it's driven by hormonal factors, uh, which is of particular interest to me because I am a transgender woman, uh, meaning that I was assigned male at birth, grew up being told I was a boy, uh, not really feeling very much at home in that uh, and I transitioned uh, to live as a woman, and I transitioned medically to ensure that my body would become as similar to that of other women as possible since uh, about 2017. So during the time I was doing this job search was also the time I was coming out um, as a woman and uh, trying to sort of reshape my life around that, which I, I'm sure there are other questions you might have about. So I'm, I'm sort of curious about this because it has immediate impact on my life in several ways. And uh, I just keep applying scientific approaches to anything that I come across because ultimately that, I would say, is the most important aspect of my identity. I am first and foremost a scientist uh, who happens to be a woman who happens to be trans. You said something that I find... I suppose interesting that mm -hmm. at the same time you were applying for your group leader positions in 2017, that this is the same time you were coming out with your identity as a woman. Yeah. And I guess I can't imagine, like, I, I feel like that maybe would have been very stressful, but maybe it was also very freeing. Like, could you talk about dealing with those two very important times in your life at the same time? It was extremely stressful, to be honest. I am very grateful that period is over. Um, the reason why this was stressful is that I am 40 years old now. I uh, should have transitioned a long time ago, and there are several reasons why I think I didn't. Part was that I wasn't really aware that 
it was possible for me. I wasn't aware that someone who felt the way I was feeling could be considered to be like actually trans and not just weird. Uh, because when I grew up, there weren't really any any role models, and those that did exist were very different from me. Either the sort of a, uh, if you are really trans, you're supposed to be like this fifties housewife stereotype. You have to be straight. You have to be sort of wanting to live a very normal, very settled life because that was the the normative picture that was provided from from media and from trans care at the time. Uh, and additionally, uh, there were certainly no role models that I was aware of for how to combine being uh, queer, let alone trans, in the scientific area. Because again, I haven't really seen people around me as I, as I move forward. And um, that meant that I was very uncertain on whether or not I would be hireable. Uh, but I was also uh, finally having concluded that I couldn't go on as I had, like I wouldn't be able to keep on functioning if I didn't finally address what I needed, uh, who I needed, who I needed to be in order to feel that I was a person and not just some sort of robot being piloted around by a sad disembodied ghost. That meant that I was needing to negotiate uh, the reactions of others that was always and still are, I would say, difficult to predict. Uh, I want to add here that I feel extremely privileged in a number of ways. Uh, I'm not fully sure why I have been so lucky. Uh, I'm sure that being white, being sort of mostly neurotypical, though that's not entirely certain uh, coming from sort of supportive uh, family circumstances and so on helps. Uh, but I also sometimes wonder if I've just been, been blessed somehow because I have had very few negative experiences since coming out. Uh, I have almost never been challenged, almost never been treated poorly or not recognized. And that is in stark contrast to what many of my siblings are, are telling me. Um, sometimes I wonder if people are afraid of me or that I'm somehow protected by that. But uh, I also never know how people regard me. I don't know if people like me. I don't know if people are just being polite to me. But that also meant that I couldn't really predict how I would be received when I was trying to uh, find uh, tenure positions. And I wanted to start, try to sort of probe the possible reactions. And in hindsight, looking back, I began that process far before I realized that I was uh, a binary trans woman. Like I spent decades thinking, well, I'm some sort of non-binary person. I'm not definitely not a man, but I don't feel I can call myself a woman. So um, I was gradually changing my presentation more and more during that time uh, to, in hindsight, I guess, try to ensure that people wouldn't really expect me to be uh, a uh, straight cis man or something like that. Uh, and perhaps this is in part why I didn't experience so many negative reactions, but going to interview in places, I needed to somehow check, would this place be reacting negatively to me? Would people here react negatively to me if I were to come out as a binary trans woman, but without also making the interview situation awkward or making myself sort of immediately deselected. In the end, I was sort of continuously pushing sort of in every circumstance, how far can I go? Like how, how weird can I be for people still to accept me? And that fear was, that fear was sort of with me all throughout. And I think that that is probably at the root of these many years of trying to overcompensate and uh, Hyper focus on on building networks and publishing papers and everything that I've been trying to do, because I I notice in myself that when I 
fear, I have learned over time to push that, to dissociate away from that fear and to go into some mode where I try to focus into doing something constructive instead, which isn't the most restful of things, but I feel still blessed that this is my reaction rather than to freeze, because at least it means that while I keep on accumulating more need for, for antibiotics and for therapy, I'm, I'm at least sort of building some degree of, of, of security around me. And it's the same now in a way in trying to build up a portfolio enough that I can convince uh, them to, to get me tenure. It was definitely beyond my choice of where I was applying to. So I was realizing that while there's lots of universities in lots of places, I couldn't really see myself going to live longer term any place which wasn't very liberal and cosmopolitan. So I was looking at London, I was looking at Berlin, which is again where I ended up, I was looking at Stockholm, but not really many other places simply because I figured I'd be very, very alone, even if the university would be a welcoming environment. I would need to be somewhere where there exists a community of other queer people. And this is in part because at the time I never expected to be able to, uh, as, well, the term is problematic, but, uh, to pass as a, uh, as a woman. I don't know if I do. Like, I don't know if people who observe me see me as a cis woman, which would be wrong, uh, or as a trans woman, or if they don't realize that I'm trans at all and think I'm a man. Like, I have no idea how people perceive me. But given that strangers more and more treat me like they treat other women, I'm beginning to feel that perhaps I'm passing better than I think I am. And perhaps my possibilities of sort of living just like any other woman, at least here in Berlin, are like increased. That at least was a reason why I was restricting my job search fairly narrowly. And when you're in a very specialized field, you're looking for tenure track positions for your particular line of research that you're passionate about, and you're restricting to a very few places in the world to do this. It's a complex job search situation. So I went, well, here at the NDC, I was interviewing actually, and each time you had these applicants coming for the symposium and everyone has nature papers like it's this is in part academic career paths being messed up and uh, i don't know it's it's i don't understand how people get hired i don't understand necessarily how i got hired except sort of collaborating with as many people as possible and making myself as useful as possible it was a stressful time it's still a stressful time but it's far less stressful now when i decided that well i'm just going to assume that I'm home now and that I can start building a home. And if that changes, then I'll have to deal with that later. But for now, I'm just going to do my best and uh, be present in the moment. And that is, in a way, also why I transitioned, I suppose, to be able to just live and feel that I am real and exist as a person who can feel things and who can be embodied and experience living in the world instead of someone who is constantly sort of fighting just to function. It's really interesting to hear the whole experience of how, you know, you were nervous and it was stressful, but it also sounds like even though you were nervous about sharing your identity in the in your job search, that it also was really important to share that yes. part of yourself to make sure that you would end up in an environment where you were accepted privately, professionally as your true self. And so... I imagine I must have taken just a lot of strength to go through with that in a time when you were just coming out. So this is again an area where I feel blessed that I have a, a coping strategy to things I fear, which is related to trying to fight the sources of the fear rather than being made uh, passive from it. So when I'm afraid of something, I, I overcompensate if I fear something, I have to talk about it, I have to deal with it, I have to sort of try to be able to tell myself I've done everything I can to solve the situation. Uh, so when I'm afraid of people sort of finding something out about me, that's when I tell them about it, which is why I'm 
inclined so much to oversharing as I do, which people who follow either of my Twitter accounts will know. Like it's simply safer to, or I feel safer dealing with something that I'm aware of than dealing with something that I'm not aware of. So yes. But then not knowing whether or not something I could do and trying to sort of carefully tread that line was stressful at the time, absolutely. But on the other hand, I don't think academic job searches are ever non-stressful. Yeah, that's true. I think it's a great skill that trying to be proactive and kind of trying to fight the source of your fears, which is probably helpful or important for everybody, I guess. Maybe especially for scientists. It is a virtuous cycle. So if the more you habitualize that response, the easier it is to fall back into it. And I think this goes for a lot of things. Like if you force yourself to respond in a way that you want to respond, the next time it will be a little bit easier and the next time it will be a little bit easier and so on for good and for ill. I want to know how has your life changed since transitioning? So before I came out uh, as a trans woman, I, okay, that's another sort of interestingly longish tangent about inspiration and so on. I'll try to be super brief about it, but I was having this meeting with a person in Berlin in 2013 that was literally life-changing because I realized that this person was living their life exactly as who they were and being entirely honest to themselves and uh, that, okay, I should try to embody in myself what I admire about this person, namely being uh, 100% honest to myself and others. And uh, that meant gradually trying to at least sort of avoid the situation of uh, finding myself waking up at 50 and being professionally dependent on having people continue to believe I was somehow a cis man. So I was shifting towards presenting more and more androgynous, like I gradually, like I stopped wearing, back in university I started wearing makeup and I started wearing makeup all the time because I realized when I do that it felt okay seeing my face in the mirror and I felt that like it wasn't so draining to meet with other people, but then I started my PhD studies and I figured, huh, what if I'm going to be discriminated against? I wasn't actually, but I was afraid of it. So I stopped doing that at work, but did it sort of the moment I, I, I left the office and uh, in all my other social interactions. I started doing that again. I started sort of shifting how I was presenting. I actively tried to ensure people couldn't really know who I was into or that people knew that I was into several people of several different genders, like trying to signal androgyny as much as possible at that point, though at that point, I mean, I was never trying to sort of not be feminine. It's just I wasn't sure how much I dared to present feminine Presenting as a gender isn't the same as necessarily being that person because, of course, you can be a woman who is presenting very butch, very masculine, and vice versa. Uh, but it was a way for me to try to communicate, please don't see me as uh, what you might otherwise think I am. But I was quickly disillusioned in that people sort of defaulted at interpreting me anyway as a man, uh, no matter what I did. Uh, and I realized I had to sort of move all the way into very performative femininity to ensure that I was read differently and that I didn't really dare to do until I I was willing to accept the risks and that did take me like 37 years of life to get to a point where I was realizing that I if I didn't accept those risks then I wouldn't be able to be happy anyway so you said that you you started presenting more and more female, yeah. but you use you use the word performative, you know, like <sighs> that you had to perform as a female. And so I guess I wonder, do you feel like you have to kind of overdo it in order to feel accepted? And and if 
if people would just accept you as female without that performative nature, would that feel a little more true? Or do you actually feel like being very, very female is is you I'm... this is a wonderful question this is a great question so uh, uh all of the above i guess in different ways so um i am still relatively in the early stages of transition which means that i'm acutely aware of how i can be misunderstood and that means that i feel i need to overcompensate to uh, reduce my own fears of being seen in the wrong way because ultimately it's about the self that I see reflected in the eyes of others, whether that is a self that feels like me or not. Now, I do believe that I am inclined to be somewhat stereotypically feminine, femme-presenting, and like that is in many ways where I feel at home, but it is also something that I want for, to be a choice, not a chore, and something that I don't always want to do. And this is also true in regards to things that are not just how you dress or how you move or how you speak, but also how you behave. Like I have felt many times that I need to hide anger or certain types of assertivity because I know that if I were to show that, then people would interpret me as male, whereas if I had been a cis woman, I would have just been interpreted as sort of uh, um, assertive. And I mourn that a bit because there are butch expressions and tomboy expressions in particular, which I think I would feel at home with because I know that's what I've always been admiring and seen as my role models in fiction if only I could feel safe doing it. But it's not just about how other people would react, but also about how I can see myself. Now, what I am noticing in the last year, maybe, and it's accelerated since I had uh, gender confirmation surgery last year, is that I feel more confident. And I feel thereby that I can relax more and I feel that I have to perform less. And one thing which feels very validating to me is that I have recognized this behavior from uh, cis uh, teenagers and children where you often have this thing of sort of being hyper-performative in uh, cultural signifiers of one sex and gender at sort of certain stage of teenagehood. And then that sort of relaxes when you realize it's fine. I am who I am and I don't need to prove it all the time. I think this is something that's strongly intersecting with our positions in society. And I think it's also a way in which people who are at the risk of not being recognized for other reasons, for instance, they belong to another marginalized identity, may need to perform also their gender more uh, explicitly in order to feel secure and feel safe. Like someone was describing it, well, I knew this was a I knew this was a very white middle class party because no woman would wear so little makeup in the in the hood where I come from. Like I mean, these are experiences that people have because we are all situated at this sort of intersection between aspects which affect us, and it's definitely something which then becomes a part of the the, the trans experience in different ways. But you have a lot of people who sort of begin. Uh, teenagely hyper-performing and then relaxing more and more. Like, for me, I mean, I noticed, like, after I had enough uh, laser and, and, and electrolysis to no longer have substantial uh, facial hair growth, I just realized, oh, I don't have to put on makeup every day. And that just felt so relaxing. Because Isn't I, it freeing? It's amazingly <laughs> freeing. <laughs> And like, but it, it it takes a time to get there, to 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 get to that point. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's not necessarily something where others can necessarily help because it's not just about others, but about how I see myself. But it's it's, I mean, I guess it's it's, it's part of life. It's part of what it is like being being a person with a gender. <laughs> But I think it's a really interesting shared experience that you have touched on because I definitely think back to being a teenager and like exploring what 
what femininity or what kind of person I want to be. Like, do I want to be super girly? Do I want to be a tomboy? Like, do I like wearing makeup? And in the end, like I settled on, like, I don't like wearing makeup, but I definitely like to still explore like different facets of what it means to be feminine. And so I think it's a really interesting, like, shared experience that you touch on is like w- w- the discovery of womanhood and like where you you fit on that spectrum right and that's also what i think to some extent if there is something that i would say is the core of what i see as positive womanhood in how it can be constructed and understood culturally it is to live in a space where everyone has opinions about who you are and whether you are legitimate in that and uh, taking ownership of that and deciding that you get to decide that. No one gets to say that this is something that's an intolerable contradiction in you. And um, that experience, um, I'm getting teary-eyed thinking about it, that is uh, that is something where I feel so much sisterhood and solidarity with other women, trans or cis, throughout all the things we are going through. That's a very interesting point also, just that I feel like this is something that every everybody has to go through also, right? This way of, so specifically now, for example, for me as a cis woman and becoming more and more feminist, thinking more and more about these things in the past few years, I'm also just letting down more and more things that I thought some years ago that I should do or have to do as a woman or how we should be... Um, what you said also before is so interesting about the behavior that is more male stereotypically or more female, like being aggressive or not aggressive. And I'm just trying to put more and more of these things down and just being myself also, which I feel like a woman, but I don't have to do all of these female stereotypical typical things. Um, so I see like very interesting parallels also that in a way, maybe for you transitioning you kind of need it or need some of these tools, but mm. then step by step, you can maybe also let go of this. So that's a very interesting thoughts, I find. I mean, there's so much shame associated with almost everything associated with womanhood in one context or other, because that's how patriarchy works. In a way, I feel that is central to what I, how I want to act as a feminist. Like I want to be, neutral with regards to how other women do femininity. I don't want to either impose an expectation of a certain behavior or to shame it. It it, it comes up again and again in one way or other. No no one gets to decide except for except for the person living it. Yes. I think a lot of women can identify with being told don't be too girly. Oh, don't wear makeup. It's about inner beauty, but be this beautiful. Like I, I, I think a lot of the experience is is shared in addition to I'm sure the unique experience that you've had with your identity and not feeling accepted. On that note, I also want to try to be a little more inclusive in the sense that I don't feel I was ever I was ever a man, but I do know what the experience of being uh, a non-stereotypical man is like. I know how boys and men are treated, and I feel very, very much sympathy for that and for what it is like to try to not incorporate toxic masculinity and to work out a way to be masculine in a positive sense. That was not what worked for me or what I wanted. But I I feel I feel that cis and trans men who try to build better masculinity, they are my brothers and I love them for it. And uh, I know that that's not a uh, an easy thing to do. It's often a thankless task, and I am thankful anyway for when when they try to do that. And I think it makes sense for us to perhaps be aware of that struggle as well. Um, diversity is a shared human experience, and individuality is a shared human experience, and living in the scope of 
norms in social human experience. Perhaps this is the case because we are pack animals who keep on looking at sort of creatures around us to try to see who we are reflected in the eyes of others. Mm -hmm. It's just that when I look to see myself reflected, uh, I look to other women. Uh, and when a man looks to see himself reflected, he looks to other men. And I think this is why we need role models who are like us, because even if we can be inspired by people who are not fully like us, it's just not quite the same. <laughs> That's our show. Thanks for joining us and thanks to our guest Sophia Forslund. Join us next week when we continue talking to Sophia about the importance of role models and how we can improve inclusivity in science. That's all from us. Until next time. Bye. Bye, everyone. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group known as the Offspring Magazine. This episode was produced by Alison Lewis and Sandra Fendel. It was edited by Alison Lewis and Adrian Lahola Jomiak. The intro outro music is composed by Srina Dramkuma and the pre intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Cariso. The podcast series is hosted by Adrian Lahola Jomiak, Alison Lewis, Beatrice Landsbergen, Nikolai Hermann, Sandra Fendel, and Srina Dramkuma, with social media support by Nadia Pirogova. For any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcast at phd.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe and see you. Bye-bye.